Hmm. Hmm. All right, guess I get to start with a quote. Sucking at something is the first step to being kind of good at something. Jake the dog, adventure time. Um, this is kind of, kind of, surround the general theme of this talk, which is kind of, you want to start sucky and then get good. Um, this talk is titled Unreal JS. I'm going to leave Unreal JS towards the very end. It's fun, um, it's kind of technical, but we'll get there eventually. So I'll start you with a story. Every year in March, thousands of, de thousands of developers flock to the Game Developers Conference, which is held in San Francisco, where I live. And sometimes I would attend and listen to talks and hang out with game developers. One thing I notice about this particular group of creative and highly technical people is this. They are extremely modest about what they are capable of. All game developers will ever want to do is make games. And what frustrates me is that they are capable of much more. Their talents can be applied to interactive art, installations, generative arts, motion graphics, special effects, 3D printing, much, much more. And likewise, I have an endless respect for web developers. You guys wrangle MVC frameworks and navigate the chaotic and confusing world of the DOM, CSS, JavaScript, and more. And like game developers, we only ever do what we know. And so all this talent is funneled into making endless web pages. So anyway, what I want you to get out of this talk is to think outside the box. I'm going to show you some projects that go back and forth between web dev and non-web dev and show you how fluid things can get with the tools that you already know. And so here we go. This is a demo reel of Bradley Monkowitz, uh, better known as Gmonk. He's a motionographer, creator, and a fake UI wizard. And you've seen some of his work in films like Tron and Oblivion, which is where this video comes from. None of his interfaces are interactive, or even if they were, they would be terrible to use. Even so, I wanted to make a specific that specific interface that's identical to the ones that he's animated, right? It just says practice. So I started by creating an Illustrator vector design that's identical to one of the animated UI elements in Oblivion. This is exported to SVG and rendered in the browser using this library called 2.js, which is a two-dimensional vector graphics animation library. So to animate this UI, I coded multiple behaviors similar to that video clip. For example, this is called radial slide, since all the elements are sliding outwards from a fixed center point. The animation behavior is attached to the layer's name in Illustrator, so that when the SVG is read into JavaScript, it'll perform that animation behavior. And this allows me to define how each element animates directly within my editing tool, which is Illustrator. So when playing back in a browser, I can modify or interrupt the animation at any time, and it's now interactive. And with sound, it looks something like this. Film and video games are a major source of inspiration for me. This is a game called Mass Effect. You play as Commander Shepard, navigating the galaxy. You go on dates with blue aliens and solve an intergalactic mystery. And this is the UI that you use to traverse the galaxy. You can fly around in different solar systems and orbit alien planets and read descriptions of each planet, its geological activity, its atmosphere composition about beings who lived on it, and its relevance to the galactic community. And I was playing this, I wondered what real astronomical data looked like. And after a brief Google search, I found a simple CSV file a version of what's called the HYG Star Catalog, which contains about 100,000 stars. Their location in the night sky, distance from Earth, temperature, and so on and so forth. I wanted to see if I could create a UI for exploring this data set in the style of Mass Effect. To do so, I used WebGL to display high-performance graphics in your web browser. WebGL is supported by every major browser now on most devices, including mobile, and is used all over the place now 
including the PlayStation 4's interface. That's actually WebGL running. So I use a library called 3.js. It abstracts away all the hard parts of WebGL and lets you simply define geometries and materials and lights and cameras within a scene. 3.js comes with some primitives like cubes, spheres, and torus knot here, which you can create by calling a new torus knot geometry, and then adding it to the scene. So I plug the data from the star catalog into 3.js and visualize the positions in 3D space as particles. The text shown on top here um, are HTML elements sitting on top of a canvas. And these are used to show the star names. For example, the sun is named Sol and the nearest star system is Alpha Centauri, shown here as Proxima Centauri and Rival Cantaris. These are sort of old star names. To anchor the stars relative to the Milky Way galaxy, I mapped one unit length of uh, WebGL graphics, one unit length, to one light year. So uh, if the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light, light years in diameter, I simply sized it to 100,000 units long. So everything could be scaled against that. In order to visualize our location inside the Milky Way galaxy, I generated a spiral galaxy using particles so that I can position the stars in roughly the correct spiral arm in the galaxy. To visit a star, I wrote a GLSL, GLSL shader to simulate solar flares and gaseous surfaces of a star. This star shader is customizable to look like other stars by adjusting its noise pattern color based on the temperature of the star from astronomical data. Here's what the experience looked like. We published this project with the help of some friends at Google as a Chrome experiment which is what Google uses to showcase bleeding edge web technologies. And we were also really lucky to hire the guy who composed the original music for Mass Effect, uh, the galaxy map for this piece. So this project was released in 2012, which is kind of ancient in terms of how quickly the web moves. The last year I had the opportunity to make a sequel to this project with a company called Online Star Register. This new project, titled One Million Stars, gave me a chance to see how far we can push WebGL in 2015. So I hired a game developer to work with me to create this new star model, uh, with a, complete with a 3D corona. And I also wanted to improve the audio experience of this work so that there's soundscapes that play at every zoom level. We also created a new galaxy using this old school game graphics technique called dithering to create this illusion of interstellar dust that block light. And for the past six or seven years, I've been contracted to make many game-like experiences, either for data visualization, for kiosks, displays, for events, etc. And they've always involved web technologies because of many reasons. This is a project that I created for Google called Arms Globe, which visualizes weapons trade around the world. This was intended to be used as a visualization tool for a conference in Los Angeles. However, since we built it using the web stack, we could easily share it to journalists, and we open sourced it for other researchers. Many of my clients enjoy the ability to show projects directly on the internet, and that means not having to download or install anything in order to see it. You just click a link and it runs pretty much instantly. The web stack allows them the option to also have an installation version if they ever choose to. Um, for example, in Chrome, you can enable kiosk mode via the startup flag dash dash kiosk, which limits the browser to certain things like, you know, closing the window. What about showing VR content? VR is still limited, so how do you share VR experiences to people who don't yet have a Vive or Oculus Rift. This is Tilt Brush, um, Google's app that allow you to draw and sculpt in 3D to help communicate what this is to people without VR headsets. We hired several artists such as sculptors, industrial designers, and fashion designers to use this application and create artwork that we can share online through a browser. And since Tilt Brush itself is a desktop application, 
written in Unity, we had to do, do a lot of magic to make that work. So we modified TiltBrush such that when someone draws, our plugin records the control points and orientations of the controller output and outputs this into a JSON file. And then we wrote some Node.js code to process and compress this data. We converted these points into polygons and then we fused them together to create strokes. Some of the meshes, or some, some, some of the brushes, have texture, like this oil paint material, that changes every time you create a stroke. And this, this is a texture atlas that's used, so that every stroke randomly picks from this list of textures, and it's done by randomly modifying, or done by modifying the textures, uh, the texture coordinate of the stroke geometry. So on the left here is um, what the brush looks like the brush stroke looks like in tilt brush, and on the right is the same brush stroke in WebGL. In order to test the system, we, want, we went into um, VR and just painted a scene for 20 minutes straight and filled it up with completely with as many strokes as we can, and it still ran, ran very quickly. In fact, it ran at 60 frames a second in WebGL, totally perfectly. However, to show artists themselves painting in VR, we shot them with two Microsoft Kinect cameras. On the bottom, you see the artist's depth information, and then on the top is their color information. The color information actually comes from DSLR cameras because, um, well, they provided better resolution than the Kinect cameras did. So anyway, we use this information to create a point cloud of the artist, which looks like something like this. And this is done by mapping the video information, um, the, the depth information, back into 3D, since the color captured by the Kinect cameras already represent depth. And this is what the final product looks like with a user interface. So you can go through a gallery of artists and see their sketches. And you can adjust their playback speed. And since we have their head-mounted displays tracking information, we can switch to their point of view at any time to see what they're looking at when they draw so you can get an idea of like, them changing their mind and changing their colors of the brushes, et cetera. What's, we, what's neat about working on these projects is that the subject matter is quite out of my comfort zone usually. I had no education on cosmology or global arms trade or any experience with VR development whatsoever. And through these, I was able to learn quite a bit. So remember how I said I hang out at a game developers conference and that's because I moonlight as a game developer. It's a hobby that sometimes pays for itself. So I created a game called Blade Symphony. It was a dream of mine to create a multiplayer sword fighting game. And this game was programmed in C++ using the Source Engine. It has several thousand hand animated character animations. This was eventually finished and released on Steam after seven years of development with an international team of people working on it for free and eventually a revenue share model. Sometimes I would participate in game jams, such as the Ludum Dare, where you're challenged to make a game within 48 hours. These game jams are great for participating or for practicing your craft as well as trying out new, strange, and new, strange and new ideas. So this is my first game jam. I collaborated with a friend of mine and we made a game about escaping a randomly generated prison. So the first time you scout, uh, first you have to scout out the prison layout, which is different every time you play. And eventually an escape route opens and you have to find your way there while avoiding all the guards. And along the way you can pick up random objects like cigarettes and bribe guards and make them go away. Or you can pick up a knife and stab a fellow inmate and cause mayhem. Um, this game is made using PhaserJS, which is a great little 2D game library, which uses the Canvas API. And here's a neat trick. When I created the Fog of War, which is the dark area that represents places outside of your vision, I originally rendered these as semi-transparent rectangles. That technique was really so slow to render. So as a hack, I tried drawing the fog of war down at half resolution and then blowing it back up. And by doing so, the, brow the browser was actually blurring the texture for me for free. So I got a nice blur effect on the right. The Little Dare game jam themes are voted on by the community. On my second game jam, the theme was beneath the surface. 
And so this is shortly after the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, and the wreckage was nowhere to be found. So uh, I decided to create this flight wreckage searching game. I wanted to see if I could create a 3D game using WebGL within 48 hours. And so here we're back using 3.js. So your goal is to guide and search, uh, guide search, re search and rescue ships around these randomly generated islands. And you're looking for the wreckage and ultimately the black box, which wins you the game. Um, the flight's original path is highlighted here in bright yellow dotted line. And there's some game mechanics like public support in which like if over time you lose, pub you lose public support and if you, um, if you pick up ocean trash instead of plane wreckage, you lose more public support. And once the game is over, it's revealed to you how the plane has diverted from its original path and exploded and shows you the physically simulated path that, that the debris took to get to their final destination. All right. The current game that I'm working on is a city simulation game. This is not it, by the way. <laughs> this is SimCity. <laughs> this is a game created by the simulations game designer Will Wright. This SimCity, above all else, is a toy, a simulation where you play as mayor and you designate roads and zones such that it is beneficial to the population living there. You overcome problems such as traffic choke points, pollution, power management, and crime. To make the game different, I was inspired by three primary sources. So first, the genre of cyberpunk from films like Blade Runner in the form of the 80s depiction of dense dystopian cities dominated by mega corporations and foreign powers, primarily from the fear of a Japanese techno-industrial takeover. Similarly, Mamoru Oshii's haunting look at a futuristic Tokyo in Ghost in the Shell, where humanity begins to question its own existence after given the capabilities of replacing our own body parts with cybernetics. And along with Blade Runner, the two embody cyberpunk's themes of a breakdown in social order due to the class struggles between the wealthy and the poor. And finally, I wanted to capture the look of nighttime time-lapse photography as closely as I can, complete with aerial warning lights, streams of car lights on roadways, wall-to-wall -wall billboards, um, in this dense urban jungle made of glass and concrete and electricity. And I wanted to do all of this with JavaScript. <laughs> the toy language that nobody likes and everyone's forced to use. Just about everyone on Reddit's programming neckbeard forum hates this language. So why JavaScript for game dev? Because it's the technology that I'm currently very familiar with. I mean, I do client work with JS. It's not slow at all if you offload all your graphics onto the GPU. In fact, JavaScript can be very, very fast. And it's a great language for prototyping, which is important in indie game dev, where you want to try out new ideas very quickly. So as I grew more accustomed to writing JS and different ways to write it, I actually enjoy writing JS more and more. It's an elegant language, and I'm not saying this out of some kind of Stockholm syndrome, where I've been abused by it for many years. I used to not listen to anything Douglas Crockford had to say, mainly because I thought his name sounded stupid. Douglas Crockford. <laughs> I mean, it's not his fault. I mean, he doesn't get to choose his last name. But anyway. Linting JavaScript is a pain in my ass. And so the, as I more, wrote more and more JS, I discovered that really his style is really, really good. 
He doesn't ever use new, he doesn't ever use this, apply, bind, ever. Everything is made with functions and closures, and it's really elegant. Combined with some of the latest features in JavaScript ES6, this language becomes a fine vintage for me. So I began writing a ton of prototypes. So first, I wrote some drawing prototypes. These were rendered in Canvas, but more importantly, I was getting the geometry to split correctly when creating intersections. So here, I'm clicking and dragging to form road connections represented by lines, and uh, the intersections represented by boxes. Another prototype was hit detection along a 3D terrain, since I knew that eventually I wanted hills and mountains in my game. And this technique, technique of hit detection is done through color sampling. So the topology is rendered with colors that represent the XY coordinate and Z coordinate. And the array cast is shot, well, there's no array cast here. I'm just sampling the color, and then I'm converting that back into a 3D coordinate. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so I didn't end up using this prototype, but it taught me about this technique regardless, which is kind of cool. Um, so these prototypes combined to form another that allowed me to start drawing roads in 3D. In addition, I wanted to see if I could create arbitrary um, zoning along road paths, as highlighted here when my mouse moves near the roads. I started by prototyping ways that I can turn a 2D polygon into a 3D mesh. Here, the planes are simply replicated upwards, and I wanted to create an example of a UI that showed the distribution of what's inside this building. So for example, um, the ground floors could be commercial and the upper floors could be residential, mixed use. Here, more experiments were done to see if I could generate interesting building footprints based on randomly generated initial outlines. So, initial, I, I, so ideally, this would create footprints that would resemble more European cities um, with a courtyard in the middle. And at, it's at this point where I realized um, I was way in over my head with arbitrary road and zone shapes. The math started to get really complex. And so I went backwards and simplified. I started playing around with PhaserJS again, and I wanted to see if I could prototype the game entirely in 2D on a tile grid. So Phaser has this vibrant community that write plugins for the engine, and one such plugin was this isometric tiles plugin that allow you to fake 3D with overlapping sprites. I started creating an old school SimCity type game in 2D by implementing zones and roads. The graphics here are rendered procedurally. This means that the sprites are generated while the game is running. Internally, there's a copy of 3JS still running in a web worker, and it generates the necessary geometry of that chunk of world and returns, the 2D, returns them as 2D textures. For gameplay, I wanted to simulate various cultures of people living in the city. That's a painting by Sid Mead, which inspires me a lot. To do so, I created large catalogs of attributes and, and properties that can describe a subculture. And these are selected using a library called Chance.js, which gives you a seeded pseudo random numbers and has a ton of features for generating random names, places, and picking random items from a list. Here are some examples of randomly generated cultures that get generated. So this is a simple script written in Node that can output um, as many as you want. And this one's my favorite. So the underling people from former Karaku, that's a randomly generated nation. They highly value fun, and they discriminate against social status. And their common characteristics are that they smell of home cooking. They are prone to after-work alcohol abuse. They're tempestuous. They're amazing in bed carries around large bags of unknown contents, no sense of social disorder, or social order, in fact, and parties like there's no tomorrow. Anyway, back to game graphics. I wasn't satisfied with how the buildings looked, so I wrote a standalone 3JS building generator as a test utility. So the sliders on the right here is this thing called DAT GUI. Um, they're controllers that can be hooked up to any JavaScript object uh, and we can change the variable in real time. It's very useful for debugging creative code such as this. The building generator takes the tiles that the building occupies and generates a footprint. And by combining the tiles, we can perform operations on it, such as shrinking or expanding it. Um, this is done by using a library called Clipper.js, which is originally written in C++ and then ported over to JavaScript. And this allows you to perform Boolean operations on these shapes 
and shrink and expand them very quickly. Again, this is all done on a separate thread via a web worker, and the finished geometry is shoved back to the main thread to be uploaded to the GPU. So here, I'm changing the alignment for each of these repetitions to create sort of New York-looking skyscrapers. I can change the iteration, how many times this thing goes up. Um, here, I'm clipping the corners, and you can see this little rectangle that represent the subtraction volume that I'm going to be subtracting away from this. And so by modifying that, I can make the building quite different. And there's a whole bunch of other attributes to this. So here's what these procedurally generated buildings look like back in the 2D isometric engine. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't very happy with this. My generated buildings looked fantastic in 3D with really nice lighting and ambient occlusion. And in 2D, they lost a lot of their charm. Besides, this is far away from the visual aesthetic that I wanted to go for. Remember, just be ambitious. So I still had that 3D road drawing prototype. So therefore, I, I started prototyping the entire game again in 3.js, rewriting all of the graphics and control code. Here's a prototype showing buildings being constructed in this new prototype rendered in 3.js. Remember, I really wanted to get the visual look and feel of a city at night with lots of glowing lights. So I imported a modified version of 3.js renderer using a technique called deferred rendering. The main benefit between this normal forward rendering and deferred rendering is that it allows me to have a ton of lights. Each street lamp here is its own point light. The buildings themselves also have ground lights to light themselves. And yet, even after working on this for a while, WebGL simply wasn't holding up for what I wanted it to do. In fact, I was a few versions behind on 3.js, and after I had updated it, I realized that the deferred lighting renderer that creates this look has been deprecated, all because the guy working on it didn't want to work on it anymore. And this was a hard lesson in open source software. The stuff you rely on, unless it's backed by a big company, could at any point go poof. And if your development cycle is long, like years long, the odds that your open source dependency is, goes towards 0%. And I was faced with a hard decision. I could either migrate all of my code to the latest version of 3.js and then manually fix somebody else's renderer, which I didn't fully understand. And this would be a huge time investment. I could switch to another WebGL framework. Some good ones include Play Canvas, uh, which is both a game framework as well as an editor, which that part isn't free. Unfortunately, their renderer doesn't support deferred rendering either. Um, mostly because the current WebGL doesn't support multiple render buffers. And the reason why it worked before with a deferred render in 3.js is that it was just a hack and it's really slow. So what about porting my game into an entirely different language like C++ using a real game engine? The estimated loss of work that I've already done thus far would be staggering. For example, I could port the game over to Unity but then that would mean I have to rewrite literally everything, including the building generator. And then I discovered Unreal.js. I saw this post on Reddit about how somebody created a plugin that allowed you to run JavaScript inside Unreal Engine. So for those of you who are not familiar, Unreal Engine is a free game engine by Epic. A lot of the big AAA games use Unreal. They make money by taking royalties and percentage of your sales that you make when you sell the game. The engine comes with a suite of rendering settings, um, lighting schemes, materials, post-processing effects like motion blur, depth of field, and glow. They all come built in. So these are the things that are expected of a solid modern game engine. The engine itself runs in C++, which is obviously really, really fast. However, it also has this visual scripting language called Blueprint, which allows non-programmers to uh, put together gameplay logic, which generally don't require high performance anyway. 
It's worth noting that games created in Unreal can be played on PC, Mac, Linux, and game consoles with mobile support, depending on the features that you enable, of course. The engine also has an experimental export to web feature, so it's converting C++ to JavaScript and running it inside a web browser via ASM, so it's going the other way. The plugin, Unreal.js, was created by Nako Sung, an employee at NCSoft, um, which is a game company in South Korea. And so this allows you to run JavaScript inside Unreal by bundling a V8 instance and so that the end, so V8 is the engine that interprets and runs your JavaScript, the same one that runs inside your browser. Now, what would be really, really screwy is if I'm porting my game from JavaScript to Unreal Engine and then used it to export to the, back to the web, is there going to be a self-contained JavaScript engine running inside the browser's own JavaScript engine? Sounds really sketchy. So anyway, I took the nosedive into this crazy world because I wanted to see what I could do with it, what I could do with a real commercially supported engine and not have to rely on janky open source browser renderers to create what I wanted to create. So you start by creating what Unreal calls an actor, an in-game object that does something and then you give the actor a component called JavaScript component which lets you point at a JavaScript file that runs while the game is running. Unreal JS comes with a JS console for easier debugging, and what's neat is that you can refer to most game objects directly from JavaScript. By doing so, you can pretty much puppeteer the entire game engine from JavaScript. Here, 2048's entire JS version grabbed from GitHub is running inside Unreal with motion blur and totally nuts. And you can also um, you can also pull NPM modules, which I use plenty of. For example, you can use Node to implement chat systems using WebSockets or pull images to be used as textures directly from the internet. There's even an example of a game that pulls its code directly from Git when you run it. And you can also transpile the code from other JS languages or JS-like languages, which I'm doing using Grunt and Babel um, to use the latest version of JavaScript, ES6. If you are totally insane, Unreal JS comes with a modified version of Jade and Angular, which talks to the game's UI so you can create your own 3D interfaces using JS, although I'm told this feature is going away in the future. To really, really lose your mind after this, um, you can dive into what's called BLUI, which is Chromium running inside Unreal. And so you can render HTML, CSS3 animations, and use web audio and web RTC directly from within the game. Um, anyway, I'm not really sure this is brilliant or a portal to development hell. Anyway, um, because the buildings in my game are entirely procedural, I couldn't just rely on importing 3D models into Unreal. I, I needed a way to get my generated building geometry into Unreal somehow, using its built-in procedural mesh component. Here, I created an Unreal Engine blueprint that takes vertex and triangle data to generate a mesh. And I can call this function directly from within JavaScript. And voila, this is my first polygon from JavaScript to Unreal Engine. As you can see, it's already casting shadows and doing all the correct lighting calculations that come for free with an engine. Remember earlier I showed you the torus knot geometry? Yeah, it's the same one here, except in JS, sends the vertices and triangles not to a WebGL renderer, but to Unreal's blueprint, which then gets rendered as a game object. And what's cool is that I can hit save anytime in Sublime Text while I'm editing JavaScript, and Unreal JS will live reload and update the game dynamically. And this is done by having a destruction function called and cleaning up any JS created objects before rerunning the script. In about two weeks, I was able to port my entire game from WebGL to Unreal Engine, and I did that while I was traveling. What's important though is what I had created, uh, when I created my game's logic, I, I made it completely separate from its view. In fact, the game simulation is so headless that you can play the game by entering commands to it directly from the command line, um, although you wouldn't be able to see anything. Here, unit tests of the game can be created without any graphics whatsoever. So I use a JavaScript feature called object.observe, which allows you to create observers to objects so that a function can fire 
at any time that, the func that an object is updated. So when a properties, properties are added and changed or removed, a function gets fired. And this is really useful since I can program the game simulation free of the view. And the view just updates or just observes the data and changes the view to update accordingly. This is somewhat similar to what a lot of web frameworks do, except that I needed a far more general solution since I'm not updating the DOM. Here's what the latest build of Cyberpunk City Simulator looks like with JavaScript running inside Unreal Engine. So keep in mind the game is still very much in development and it looks really rough around the edges right now. But already I'm surpassing what I can ever do with WebGL. And here's a screenshot with a more built out city. Since I was having so much fun with modifying procedural buildings, I said, what the hell, I may as well give this fun to the players. So I wrote a building editor in the game that lets you modify the buildings while the game is running. So all of the same tools and utilities that I was doing in the WebGL version, they all apply here. And as you can see, the Unreal Engine's lighting system is way better looking than, and much faster than anything I can develop on my own. And this is the luxury of working with a professionally created game engine. On top of that, I was able to add emissive neon lights and add other building lights where, that I weren't able to do before. All right. Although JavaScript and the web stack gave me plenty of flexibility, there were also a lot of drawbacks. So, so here's some things. Between the time I started working on this project and today, the following events took place. The deferred lighting render for 3JS was completely deprecated and no longer supported by the original author. The pathfinding library, gamlib.ai, that I was using for performing pathfinding was completely deprecated. The author simply abandoned it, the library no longer found on the web since it was never hosted on GitHub. And even the documentation vanished because he stopped paying for web hosting. JavaScript ES6 was ratified, so yay, we got a lot of new toys to play with. And then object observe went from being in ES6 to being completely dropped by you know, the ES6 people. And so now I have to use a polyfill to get back. And Unreal JS was created. So yeah, a lot of things happen within a long dev cycle. The lesson to be learned here is that open source can be really sketchy for long-term projects that take more than a year. Um, too much happened in web dev world that and people keep making and abandoning things that you have to be extremely careful of what you're using. And yet, despite all that, it's really exciting to me still, so long as my livelihood doesn't depend on it. With Unreal JS, I'm pretty sure that I'm one of five people in the world currently using it. And the one guy who's writing it and supporting it works at a big company, so that kind of gives me some degree of comfort. He speaks passable English, and he, He's really responsive on GitHub. I only shudder to think of what happens if he ever leaves that company and what would happen to my technological house of cards. So I want to close with this. Our tools are just tools. Someday, Angular will be gone, CSS will be gone, even JavaScript will be gone. Nothing lasts forever. And I think that's why it's important to never identify yourself as a developer for just front end developer, back end developer, full stack, whatever silly labels that HR comes up with. It's okay to be ambiguous because it means you're evolving. I like to get out of my comfort zone and do something unique and different and interesting. And I wish you would do so as well if you're not doing so already. Because if you're if you're not comfortable with what you're doing, you know you're, you're doing something new. And it goes a long way to clear that feeling of being stagnant to new tools. It means that meeting people and absorbing ideas from other industries, is, have, they have nothing to do with yours, and that's really, really great. In game dev, beginners are always told that their ideas are worthless. They're told ideas are cheap, Everybody has them, and your implementation is everything. The thing is, as you become more experienced, you become less accepting of crazy new ideas. And you begin to narrow and focus 
only on the things that you know how to do. Instead, what I want to give you is this. You are more skilled and talented than you know. You're not just a web developer, and your ideas, the few that survive this process of growing and becoming experienced, are extremely valuable. There's never been a better time to be a creator should you choose to put your ideas, should you choose to pursue your ideas. You have a vast and unlimited amount of knowledge and tools to help you get there. Thank you. <laughs>